Warner Wallace is a cold case homicide detective who's been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Dateline, and Court TV. Now, we join him as he applies his investigative skills to making a case for Christianity. Welcome to Cold Case Christianity with Jay Warner Wallace. My name is Jorge Gil, and tonight we have a very special episode for you. Detective Wallace will be interviewing Dr. Frank Turek and his son, Zach Turek, about their brand new book, Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. In this fascinating interview, you will learn why Hollywood can't help copying from God and how our biggest superheroes of today point towards our desire for the ultimate hero, Jesus of Nazareth. I hope you enjoy the first part of this interview. God bless. We have something special tonight. Now, look, a lot of times when I'm on Frank's show, I'm on as the guest and we're talking about a book or a topic and I said, you know, I'd love to be the one to kind of flip the table a little bit and be the host to ask you the hard questions about a book. And we just so happen to have a book we can talk about. And that's a book we're going to talk about with Frank Turk and his son, Zach, who have both written this, co-authored the book, which came out two days ago, Hollywood Heroes. And we're going to be inviting both of them on the screen with us here so we can all talk about this book because it's a book that is timely. And I, I, know I was going to ask you this earlier, Frank, and maybe you can answer this too, Zach, that I don't think we had planned on releasing the book in May uh, originally and it just so happens we're one day after May 4th that that day that some people will say may the 4th be with you and sure enough it's just in time for us to talk about the impact of in mean, kind of a crazy way of Jesus on the collective imagination of authors and screenwriters and creators over the last several decades and really over the centuries as they have imagined fictional characters in the image of Jesus in su such a way that the, the actual story of Jesus can be found on the pages of fictional works in some of the most unusual places. Now, maybe you've kind of noticed and, and seen these kinds of, uh, of parallels in, in fiction, but I bet you there's some areas and some characters of modern fiction that you'll be surprised. And once you are, once we kind of reveal it to you, you'll say, wow, you know what? You're right. That actually is an image of Jesus, and I hadn't quite thought of it that way. So what we're going to do tonight is talk about how Jesus is revealed to us on the pages of fiction. And then we'll also talk about why that might be the case. Like, what is it about the, the image of Jesus or the person of Jesus that has this kind of impact on, on creatives who are thinking? And why, is this, why are the themes of the Jesus story re-emerging over and over and over again? And how can we leverage those themes in modern creator, creative endeavors to kind of share the gospel with others? Or at least initiate conversations in which the gospel is clear. Uh, as we start talking about this, there are some provocative issues, even for today, given the culture we're in, the timeliness of this of this story, even, for example, the work of Disney and all the stuff that we're talking about, we'll be talking about tonight. I think you'll find uh, some uh, some good questions that might be uh, help you think about how Jesus has impacted culture impacted uh, fictional works and how we can leverage that for the kingdom. So with that being said, let's just jump in and invite uh, Zach and and Frank. I always think of Zach first because he's nicer than Frank, but invite <laughs> them both in here so we can talk about this. Now, look, guys, um, welcome, first of all, to your own show. Um, but, <laughs> but also- Yes, uh, yes. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Thank, thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Did Jorge give you that? that he gave button? me this, man. This is scary. It's not, it's really scary man. to have this. I created a monster, Jim. Uh -huh, yeah, uh -huh. you did create a monster. I'm glad that I, you know what, but I want you to send me that software so I can do it myself. <laughs> anyway, the point is, um, uh, but what we want to talk about tonight uh, is, is your new book, which has been, it seems like it's been forever since we first started talking about the book and since we've been anticipating the book. And I know that that the um, kind of the supply chain crisis we've been yep. in has slowed everyone's delivery. And so we, this was really something we thought would be out, I think, what, in February or March. And here we are now in May, finally getting it launched. But I think it is probably, in some ways, it's not probably, think about it. We just happened to land in that range the week of May 4th. In some ways, maybe this is meant to be. So so um, here we are, and you've got someone else from question I want to ask you. But one of the first things I want to ask before we even start is I've started doing some work also online with my son. And the age gap between the two of us is similar to the age gap between the two of you. So I want to ask before we start, 
you're writing a book about the impact of Jesus and how Jesus shows up in a lot of the kind of Christ figures we talk about in fiction. We'll get more to that in a minute, but you're coming at it really from a couple of different generations. Um, and I, I see this in my own life with Jimmy, that there are times when uh, my view as a boomer uh, is different than his as a millennial. And I wonder as you, you had to watch and read a lot of fiction, watch a lot of movies in order to write this book. Uh, tell me, uh, did you notice that there was a difference in your perception of these characters just based on the generational differences between you and Zach? Yeah, Zach had a better handle on the characters than I did. So go ahead, Zach. You, you answer that. He knows yeah. the movies he's written out. Yeah. Well, first off, Jim, uh, happy Revenge of the Fifth, if you will. If yesterday oh was gosh. May the 4th. Oh the, today is still a Star Wars day. So Star mm -hmm. Wars is our favorite movie uh, growing up. So. Can't so that's true. So congratulations. Started. So do you think that you were more familiar with some of the movies and stories you talked about in this book? For the modern ones, sure. You know, I think really one of the ways that we bonded when I was a kid was the original set of Star Wars movies. And that was some of our fondest memories growing up for sure. And, you know, dad still thinks he's Darth Vader to this day. Um, I so, find your lack of faith disturbing. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but moving on, as I kind of grew up that I took that initial experience that really was kind of profound and one yeah. of the things that got me interested in cinema and just kind of rolled with that as I grew into te my teenage years and young mm -hmm. adulthood and then even now I mean I'm going to see the new Doctor Strange movie on Saturday right I mean it's still uh, uh, something that I really enjoy okay so let's just talk about the premise of the book though for a second because mm -hmm. for those people who maybe aren't aware I and mean, you've got a huge fan base here that have been anticipating mm -hmm. this book and you've been talking about it off and on as it's been getting ready to publish but there are a lot of people who may not even understand what the print there is the image of the book right here mm -hmm. um so 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 just tell people what the basic idea what launched this idea and if i'm just looking at hollywood heroes i might be confused as to what this is about it, it, i like the fact though that it's not this obvious kind of in your face um apology Jetix book in that sense that is provocative that when I read the cover and I look at it, I'm thinking, oh, what is this going to be about? So why don't you at least kind of give the idea, the outline of what this book attempts to do? Yeah. So there's really two reasons why we wrote the book in general. So the first is if you look at the, the top selling movies of all time uh, and look at just plain box office statistics, it really boils down to almost all of them are fictional. Even the ones mm. like, let's say, Titanic or Gone with the Wind are actually historical yeah. fiction. Right, that sets something in a in a, a time event in history, and then makes everything, all the rest of it up. All the rest of it is dramatized or entirely made up. So that gets you thinking. Well, why why are we so interested in stories that didn't actually happen? And one of the ways that we really are, the reason why is because we understand that something is wrong in the world, and we're looking for an escape from it. Right. So C.S. Lewis famously put it, famously put it, is if we find ourselves with the desire that nothing in the world can satisfy. The most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. And we try and we show that on a daily basis, whether it be through sports or through cinema or through literature or music or any of that. Right. And so that's premise number one. And premise number two was actually an experience I had. I spent some time in the Middle East in my 20s and I went to a movie. I went to see the original Guardians of the Galaxy movie because, you know, I'm here. Why not go see what happens? And as I walk into this movie theater, it's full. And it's full of people who are watching a, a dubbed over movie, a superhero movie, basically. And I'm sitting here wondering to myself, like, why do all these other people care about this? I thought this was just an American thing. And that really kind of hit me with that kind of cross-cultural appeal that some of these movies have. Because the idea that someone will come and rescue us from something, that's really a superhero uh, genre, right? And that points directly back to Jesus, the idea that someone is going to come save us from this world that we live in. And that's really yeah, why we wrote it. I think that's true, Jim, of just about every world religion, even people who would consider themselves atheists. I think most of us have this deep down sense that obviously there's something wrong with the world. And wouldn't it be great if somebody could come and save us from this world of pain and suffering and take us to a place where we wouldn't have it anymore? Uh, you know, uh, Solomon said that God has put eternity on our hearts. And that's why these movies, I mean, look, we, we address movies written by Christians like Harry mm -hmm. Potter and Lord yep. of the Rings, but even movies not written by Christians, by unbelievers, they can't help put yeah. in the idea that sacrifice and salvation is something beautiful. They can't help it. 
in, yeah. in, 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 in fact, uh, you know, we go through the Avengers series. We got chapters on Iron Man and, and uh, Captain America. And as we all know, in Endgame, yep. spoiler alert, uh, Iron Man sacrifices himself to beat Thanos and save the world. Now, that enchants everybody. But imagine if, if Iron Man, Tony Stark, showed up at the scene with Thanos and said to his Avenger buddies, hey, uh, guys, you know, I'm really tired of this. I don't want to take on Thanos. I got to get back to following my heart and taking care of just me. I'm out. You guys handle it. Would, would anybody be enchanted by that? Would, would anybody go, wow, what a great story? No, we'd all go, this is ridiculous. This guy wimped out. This is this is, this is not realistic at all. Well, it might be realistic, but it's not what we want to see. We want to see victory through sacrifice. And that's what Christianity gives us. Yeah, good point. Now, okay, so so then so the, the goal of this book, then, if I'm somebody and I'm familiar with your work, um, if I, of course, I'm familiar with your work, mm -hmm. but if I'm somebody who's just out there who reads apologetics books or who reads Christian books in general, and you're familiar with what the work you've been doing for years, tell me where you see this fitting in the kind of uh, the catalog of your work and, and what it is. So I know when you wrote, for example, um, Stealing from God, what mm -hmm. your point, what you're trying to accomplish with that. Yeah. So with this book, you're making great observations about the parallels between fictional accounts, both in movies and in literature, mostly movies, all Hollywood stuff, because a lot of the stuff, though, is from literature first, like the Harry Potter movies. But my point is, um, and, and that parallels to the Jesus narrative. Yeah. But how do you see people using this? This, though in their walk with Jesus. Well, we say on the HollywoodHeroesBook.com website, if people really want to learn more about the book, uh, we say, imagine if there were a fun way to get your kids more interested in God. Imagine if there were a great way, an easy way to get people who are not Christians, but may be interested in movies to right. consider the Christian story. So the first thing we thought about was sort of a discipleship evangelism angle, that you can use these stories in order to build a bridge to either your child or to somebody you know who normally you might not be able to b build a bridge to. I mean, what do, what, is, what do you think teenagers do when mom or dad start talking about God or they start getting the Bible out? They're like, oh, here comes another lecture. Spare me, right? But if mom or dad says, hey, let's have movie night tonight, right? And then let's discuss what we saw. Okay, that's going to be a lot more fun and probably a lot more productive in some ways uh, because kids might be open to a superhero that actually models an aspect of Christianity. Yeah. Uh, Sean McDowell and I wrote a book called So the Next Generation Will Know. We talked about this idea of how do we at least be culturally sensitive enough and aware enough as parents to be able to initiate conversations that are Christian conversations, that are worldview conversations. And a lot of this will prepare us, I think, all of us to see the Christian worldview embedded in places that maybe we weren't paying attention. But that really requires... Um, us to know something about the Christian worldview to begin with. So yeah. what are the kinds of elements that you guys were looking for? In other words, the, the, the kind of broad sketch of Christianity that you were looking for in each of these movies. Go ahead, Zach. Why don't you take that one? Yeah. So we really tried to hit most of the main themes of Christianity and it's not just isolated to Jesus, right? So not ever, we're not going to try to point everything directly back to Jesus, but rather the truths of the Christian worldview. So let's take Batman, for example, right? Batman really shows us um, human nature in a nutshell. The idea that Batman is just going to go constantly back into the back into Gotham night in and night out. And no matter how hard he works and how much we respect him, there's still more to do in the next night, right? The idea that sin is basically undefeatable by humans is a really key theme in Batman. Or if we're talking about uh, Captain America, the idea that we want a morally strong leader to lead us against in the fight against evil someone mm. who despite all of the all of the badness that's going to come his way is always going to get back up off of the ground and keep going keep fighting the good fight running the race as paul says and so we try to take something unique from each one uh, and then point back to a truth in the christian worldview <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. So this is interesting. So I noticed that, you know, look, I've, I've got a chance to preview the book very early and, and I saw the list of movies. Now for, what do you, what do you think about it? I kind of see it both ways. I, if I'm somebody who's familiar with, I've already watched all these movies. I may not have noticed the parallels right. that you're discovering in the book. And that's to be, uh, it really kind of illuminates if I was to read this book after seeing all those movies. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a, an advantage, like, like you have a list of all the movies that could be watched. This book I see has value, whether you uh, have seen those movies or not. I, it almost though kind of gives me a roadmap 
of like what movies ought I watch to kind of <laughs> see some of this of this um, imaging of Jesus that you talk about. So I yeah. see the book both ways. It could be it's kind of a before or an after book. Yeah, in fact, our mutual friend Natasha Crane, who endorsed the book as well, when she read the book, she had only seen one of the I don't know forty movies that we right. <laughs> we say you might want to look at to know this book better. But she said. I didn't even need to see the movies because I could follow what you were saying by just reading the chapters and I love the book. So it's a fun book. It's more fun than just an average apologetics book because you're visualizing things you've seen and we can address the biggest issues in Christianity in this book. We address creation. We of course uh, address uh, Jesus and his deity because the last chapter is is the ultimate hero. Jesus is the ultimate hero. We address the resurrection, of course. We address the problem of evil. All of these things come up in the course of the movies. Right. And so it's easy to just segue into these issues and uh, point out even the power of weakness when you look at Lord of the Rings, right? That, that there's, there's so These movies are so rich in moral lessons for kids and even theological lessons that it was pretty easy to write, actually. Okay, so let's talk about the, how you selected the, the 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 series you did, and I think you pretty much captured a, a lot of the series that I would have thought of as well. Um, but how did you guys decide? I mean, there probably are some things you could have covered also that you decided were just going to be outside your scope, or you kind of. So how did you pick the series you did? Yeah, we had some space issues. Obviously, I mean, with, with a with a subject matter as rich as this is, some things left get left on the cutting floor. Like, hey, we thought about writing a chapter about Thor. Uh, he didn't make the cut. Maybe if we do Hollywood heroes too, he's next on the list. But that uh, that initial listing of movies I mentioned, right, was really something that we focused on. We wanted to take something that was popular. We wanted to take something that had cross-cultural appeal. And we wanted to take something that had positive examples of Christian ideas, right? Each of these things has something bad in them, right? Bad, we say, you can't you can't have a good story without sin in it. Conflict requires sin in order to be resolved. If the movie started with and they all lived happily ever after and no one, didn't, no one did anything wrong, there's nowhere to go with that. But we wanted to take something that had a positive idea that we could build off of in a way that was meaningful for you to connect with people. Okay, so here are the, 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 the series, that, or the, at least the, the chapter series of, of the different movies you took a look at. Captain America, Iron Man. And I'm going to mention these. And for the people who are, are listening, maybe you aren't familiar with the book yet. I wonder if a couple of these will raise eyebrows. Yeah. Especially for people who maybe have had a more um, very conservative view of what it is where they're going to allow. And look, we're in a generation right now where it seems like this is a hot topic, right? What the, the role that parents play in determining content for their kids mm-hmm. or determining what brands they're going to advance. Um, so we've got Captain America, Iron Man, Harry Potter, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings. Batman, Wonder Woman, um, and then you talked the last chapter about what these all point to. Mm-hmm. So, so, so I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, okay, that those all make sense, and I can see immediately because I've also written about you know Christ figures in literature. I can see already how I would kind of mine that stuff out too. But I wonder, I just can't help but wonder uh, how much pushback you've received, or at least you thought about related to the Harry Potter series, for example, right? Because so much. Um, I mean, there's lots of places where you and I speak around the country Mm -hmm. that if we just said, hey, we're writing a book about the parallels between Harry Potter and Jesus, (laughs) a lot of people would say, really? Uh, Yeah. Well, that's your, you know, they would almost discount it right away. So I was kind of glad to see, number one, that you put it right in the middle of your your grouping. So Mm -hmm. you kind of introduced the topic. I wonder if you had made that chapter one, how many people would have stumbled on it or for whatever reason. Right, right. Well, (laughs) first of all, I respect whatever parents decide for their kids, right? I think parents ought to be in control of of what their kids see and hear. Uh, and if for some reason they think Harry Potter's out of bounds, okay, it's out of bounds. However, I have discovered, and I think Zach can talk more about this as well, that Christians have not been consistent on this issue because the wizardry, first of all, the wizardry in, in the Harry Potter series is not the kind of wizardry or occult that the Bible talks about, okay? This is totally invented stuff from... J.K. Rowling's head. Um, But secondly, uh, people have been inconsistent because they say you can't watch Harry Potter, but you can watch Lord of the Rings and and Chronicles of Nardia. And and they had wizardry in them as well. I mean, Gandalf is a wizard. (laughs) I mean, that's what he does. So why do we have this kind of double standard where we're going to say Lord of the Rings and Chronicles of Narnia is okay? Well, you know, they were written by Christians. 
but Harry Potter isn't. Well, newsflash, according to J.K. Rowling's own testimony, she is a Christian. And in fact, as we point out in the in the book, uh, she says the entire series can be epitomized by two Bible verses. One is from 1 Corinthians 15, which says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And the second is from the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. She says, they can epitomize the entire series, but I never wanted to talk about really the biblical backbone of this series because I didn't want readers to know where they were going, where we were going, where I was going with the whole story. Mm -hmm. Now, Zach points out that there are actually four explicit parallels, and we point this out in the book, from G- from Harry Potter to Jesus. Zach, why don't you pick that up there and take that, because that's that's so interesting. Yeah, and Zach, yeah. I want to ask you to do this for every single chapter, because I want to reserve some yeah. of this. It's a great book, and I want people to discover it. And I know when you're flying at 30,000 feet, sometimes mm-hmm. you can't really cover all this in that kind of detail anyway. But I would like you to, to at least talk about this issue with Harry Potter. There are parallels. Let's describe them. Yeah, and there's big ones. In fact, I would say of all of the books that we cover, all the series and movies that we cover, Harry Potter is actually the best example we have of Jesus, probably in modern literature, probably since Aslan from the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, And so there's really four ways in which we see that. So number one is Harry Potter's coming is prophetically foretold. So we don't learn this until later in the books. But there is a prophecy that is spoken about Harry Potter that basically states that he is going to be the one to save us from Voldemort, who's the big baddie, if you will, in Harry Potter. The, yeah. the, the evil wizard that Harry Potter is fighting against basically the whole series. Number two is that Harry Potter lives a morally upright and virtuous life. He's not perfect, obviously, but he, especially when the cards are on the table, he makes the right choice, even when it costs him. Right. Mm. And so by living this virtuous life, he comes and shows us an example of, again, going back to the hero vibe, what we want to see in a hero. Right. The third is that Harry Potter walks willingly to his death. So mm. we, we find out late in the series that actually the way spoiler, that Harry spoiler Potter, alert again, spoiler alert again, right, yeah, right yeah. is that Harry Potter has to sacrifice himself in order to defeat Voldemort. And not only does mm. he understand that. He walks to death's door willingly. Mm. And the last is, obviously, he resurrects after he is killed, right? And so Harry Potter, just like Jesus, is actually directly called in the series the master of death. Mm. The idea that death, at at the end, no longer has power over him. That doesn't mean that he's not going to die eventually. But this idea that Voldemort, who's the exemplar of death in the series, is overcome by Harry. And he is then the master of death. And it's interesting too, Jim, at the end of this, <laughs> Harry uh, dons inv- his invisibility cloak, right? Mm-hmm. And he's inspiring his followers to believe in him so he, they can defeat Voldemort, the, the Satan figure. What does that sound like? Yeah. <laughs> That's a, he's yeah. invisible. It's, he's the spirit behind all this. I mean, if you really, and, and, and what Zach pointed out in the beginning when uh, Harry, Harry Potter was uh, prophesied before he was born, Voldemort, the Satan figure, tries to kill Harry as an infant. What, what does that make you think of? You know, Herod trying to kill the baby. I mean, she took this right out of the Bible. Okay, you know? that's a good point, though. So she's telling you, she's, she's in interviews, yeah. she's saying um, that, that this is really what inspires her, that this is mm-hmm. kind of, and she didn't want to give that away because then you would know the trajectory, the overarching trajectory of the plot. So I get that. Now, that's not true, though, probably for everyone who you've mentioned in the screenplay in these movie series. I mean, you've got one who's telling you that, yeah, that was what inspired her, what kind of laid the outline for her stories, all of that. But that's not always true. So when you see the um, the the image of Jesus, the, the, the nature of Jesus reflected in these movies, if how do we explain it? I mean, it's one thing to say, yes, I was consciously like Lord of the Rings, or I was, you know, there are several uh, um, authors and writers who are so inspired by the gospel story that they just decide I want to recast it. Uh, so that's one thing. But there's some folks who are don't even probably even recognize the fact that they're recasting it. So what do you think is the cause of these other similarities? Well, I, I don't, th- I think uh, Hollywood can't help copying from. Uh, from from God, because as I said earlier, I just think that this idea is ingrained in all of us, whether we're Christians or not, that we want to be taken from this world. That's our deepest desire. We want to escape pain and suffering, and we're enchanted by stories where someone takes us to that new world. 
Now, that's exactly what Jesus began to accomplish with his sacrifice. And of course, he's going to complete that when he comes back. But even people, as I mentioned earlier, who are not Christians and, and don't might, might not even know much about the Christian story, they can't help put that in to something that they're trying to do from an art perspective because they know it resonates with people. Okay, so wait a minute. So let's talk about this first. So are you saying they can't help but put that in? Um, are you arguing this is because we're all designed in the image of our creator? And so the story is part of the embedded image or or are we saying that they're familiar with the story because they're in western culture and because they're familiar with it it's kind of a theme that resonates or it's, it what how do we explain why we find it over and over and over again well the, they, those might be a couple of reasons but i think the main reason is is because we live in god's world and reality is su is structured in such a way that we know it's beautiful when somebody sacrifices himself to save somebody else and we also all know, regardless of our worldview, even atheists will admit there's something wrong with the world. Well, if there's something wrong with the world, we have a desire to fix it. Well, we can't fix it ourselves. We're fallen human beings. Someone has to come rescue us. All these superhero movies, there's, there's some outside force that comes in and rescues these people and takes them to the promised land. Well, that's ultimately what Jesus does. And to build on that, how do you fix it? Right? We can't come up with a better solution than someone coming to save us, not by anything that we've done, not by any virtue of our goodness or greatness, but because it's the right thing to do. And again, who does that point back to? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so so we would say this then, a, a book like this, um, and I come to something similar in person of interest where I, I see that there is, there's evidence in here. There's something here that's worth um, chasing. From an evidential perspective, but the question is: is uh, is it is it? I guess I, how strong is this evidence for Jesus? There's a way in which I look at it and say, no, it's a piece of the cumulative case of of this a nature of reality that points to one story above all. But let me just play a little. I mean, first of all, let me just read to you. This is these are the attributes that I kind of seen classically identified as Christ figuring. Now, this is a, a genre of literature that is not always um you don't see parallels to this usually outside of this it's this 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 uh, expression for example this term is unique right to to jesus and the way that he has been reimagined in fiction so here's what you see these are the kinds of attributes you see of characters that are christ figures but number one usually has a virtuous mother or a divine or a royal father To hear more from Jay Warner Wallace, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For more information on this week's topic, visit youtube.com slash coldcasechristianity with Jay Warner Wallace. Thank you for joining us on this Cold Case Christianity broadcast.